Praise the Lord. We are continuing in our studies on the heroes of the faith. And today we are talking about a beautiful uh, lady that uh, has left her mark in, uh, in our faith, in our following after God. Her name is Rahab. Uh, and, uh, and we want to speak about her and what she managed to achieve through faith and through obedience. So today we want to speak about how Rahab is an example of the faith to us and how to be obedient to God. And what is beautiful is that unlike all the personages we have studied to date, all the different individuals that we have looked at in the scriptures thus far, this woman was a Gentile. She did not belong, if you please, to the commonwealth of Israel. And so she's a little closer home to you and I, and born non-Jew, non of the faith per se, but nevertheless a woman of faith and of obedience unto God. So let us get into the lesson today with our key verse. Our key verse is found in Hebrews chapter 11 and the 31st verse. And uh, this is how it reads. It's, it says in Hebrews 11:31, by faith. Say by faith. By faith, interesting, the title here, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. And our bases or the scripture base for our lessons uh, for our lesson today comes from the book of Joshua. I'd like you to turn there with me to the second chapter. And in order to get the story that is behind the statement, we need to read really the entire chapter. So there's 24 verses. Follow along with me, if you will, as we read Joshua chapter 2 and uh, in its entirety. Uh, you might remember just prior to this that um, in the previous 40 years prior to this, actually, that the people of Israel had been going through the desert they had come to Canaan land, they had sent spies to spy out the land, and they had come back, ten had come back with a bad report, a negative report, two of them had come back with a positive report. But based on the report of those that said, no, let's not go in, the people of Israel decided to kind of vote against it, no, we don't want to go in. And as a result of that, all but two individuals from that generation, Joshua and Caleb, ended up entering into the promised land. And for the following 40 years, they wandered in desert, desert literally waiting, and, and there was a timing involved. And finally, 40 years later, they found themselves in exactly the very same position to have to enter Canaan land and take it by faith. And what we find is that in this story, uh, where they enter Canaan land, this is the very first obstacle that they uh, come across. It's the city of Jericho and that's where Rahab lives. And so this is the setting for what we are about to read. Joshua chapter 2 reads this way, And Joshua the son of Nun sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go and view the land, even Jericho. And they went. And they came into the har and harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in Hether tonight, tonight <coughs> to the children of, Is of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho said, sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they be come to search out all the country. And the woman took the two men and hid them, and said thus, They came to men unto me, but I wist not whence they were. And it came to pass about the time of shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out, whither the men went, I wot not. Pursue after them quickly, for you shall overtake them. Verse 6, But she had brought them up to the roof of the house, and hid them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order upon the roof. And the men pursued after them the way to Jordan unto the fords, and as soon as they which pursued after them were gone out, they shut the gate. And before they were laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof. And she said unto them, I know that the Lord has given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you, when you came out of Egypt, and what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sihon and Og, 
whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Isn't that beautiful? <clears throat> now therefore I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you will also show kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token that I will, sa will save alive my father and my mother, my brethren and my sisters and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. And the man answered her, Our life for yours, if you utter not this our business. And it shall be when the Lord has given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with thee. Then she let them down by a cord through the window, for her home was, up was upon the town wall, and she dwelt upon the wall. And she said unto them, get, the, get you to the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you, and hide yourselves there three days, until the pursuers be returned, and afterward that you may go your way. And the man said unto her, We will be blameless of this thine oath which you hast made us to swear. Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window which thou didst let us down by, and thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and thy father's household home unto thee. And it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of thy house into the streets, his blood shall be on his head, and we will be guiltless. And whosoever shall be with thee in the house, his blood shall be on our heads if any hand go upon him. And if thou utter this our business, then we will be quit of thine oath which thou hast made us to swear. And she said, According unto your words, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed, and she bound the scarlet line in the window. And they went and came unto the mountain, and abode there three days, until the pursuers were returned. And the pursuers sought them throughout the way, but found them not. And so the two men returned, and descended from the mountain, and passed over, and came to Joshua the son of Nun, and told him all the things that befell them. And they said unto Joshua, Truly the Lord hath delivered into our hands all the land, for even the inhabitants of the country do faint because of us. Praise God. Well, that's quite a beautiful story. And of course, if you read on in the, following, in the chapters that follow there, you'll find that God did exactly that. And we'll look at that briefly today in our lesson. Uh, time wouldn't allow to go into all details of everything that took place. But let me try and highlight for you some of the things that are uh, perhaps of use and relevant to us here today. And uh, no doubt you can continue your personal study on this beautiful person of uh, Rahab in your own time. But first of all, I focus for the lesson just so that you can appreciate this is an application to you and I. An individual's walk with God is not determined. Notice it is not determined by that person's past life or the unbelievers which surround them, but rather by his personal desire to know the Lord and live for Him. God does something beautiful when we come to Him. <clears throat> he takes our sins and forgives them and casts them into the sea of His forgetfulness. He cleanses us. Our past has no more to do with our present. And so we have nothing to do anymore. The walk with God that we have now should have nothing more to do with the past life that we may have had in the Lord. Whatever walk of life, whatever sin we might have been into, God has forgiven us and we have moved on. And that's an old us, a dead us that's gone behind us. And now uh, we are judged really by our desire, our obedience to serve Him and to love Him and to obey His word. But do notice that our love is judged by our obedience to the Word of God. We can't just say, oh, I love God and then disobey His Word. If you love me, He says, keep my words. This is really the way that we show our desire to know Him and to live for Him. <clears throat> All right, well, let me highlight first up one of the most obvious things that we want to study in our lesson today, and that is the faith that Rahab had. Uh, I want you to notice that Perhaps we might think it's unkind, but the fact is that uh, she, is, she is labeled almost everywhere that, sh that her name comes up as the harlot. 
And so I think this is very significant because it shows you that God is no respecter of persons, right? Doesn't the Bible say that? God is no respecter of persons. We can come to Him in whatever condition we may be, in what, from whatever background, and if we have a heart that desires after God, that wants and longs for God, then God will accept us the way we are. But we must leave our sin behind, naturally. And this is what Jesus is really saying to every one of us, is that Rahab's faith wasn't based on, his, on her past life, but on what she was going to become. So let me speak about this aspect of it for a moment. First of all, the fact that she was titled a harlot. Now, I'm not sure exactly uh, whether uh, you can understand this or not, but the... Um, the terminology harlot in, in, our, in our sense, in our language, is a little different to what we, we may be looking at here when it comes to Rahab. She may well have had, she may have been a, a loose woman in her younger days. But, but this time we're talking a woman that was on in her years, 50 plus. And it appears that some of these women, once they, I want to say, retired from their lifestyle, they actually began what we might, we might call a place... Uh, like a, a host place or a place uh, where they would uh, have a house of entertainment. This is from Barnes, um, this excerpt here, from Barnes' uh, a, a com commentary on the Bible. And uh, it reads this way, She might have been also a hostess, uh, one who kept a house of entertainment for strangers. Uh, it is at the same time by no means improbable since it is not infrequently that it would happen in those times, as in our days, that females of this character kept su such houses. It would be natural that strangers coming into a place uh, should act in this respect as all travelers did and should apply for entertainment of what was known as a public house. So basically these women ran a public home, a public house. <coughs> we might call them pubs nowadays. But in those days, if you were a stranger in a land, uh, you found the closest public house which may well be run by a harlot. And this was why our uh, Jewish men found themselves in a harlot's house. Some people th thought they might have been there for the business that she might have, but that's not the case. All strangers coming to a foreign city would find lodging, not in people they knew, because nobody knew them there, but in a public home. And I just wanted to explain that because it might have occurred to you, what are God's people doing in a harlot's house in the first place. It's not the place you should find the people of God. But I want to stress that Joshua and Caleb or whoever it was, sorry, the people that came, the spies that came sent by Joshua were not there to uh, satisfy some sexual desire. They were there to spy the land. And this was a lodging place, a place of lodging. However, clearly the reputation that Rahab had was not that of a married woman settled with children. Uh, she had obviously family, we know that from the, from the account, um, but it's very possible that her early years were very much that of a prostitute or a harlot. Notice again, God honors uh, faith uh, wherever he finds it. And I want you to notice that God does not hold this against her, against her in any sense. In fact, quite to the contrary, what does he look at? Say the heart this morning. The heart, that's where he looks. That's where he finds communion with us humans. If it wasn't for that, none of us would make it. Would you agree? It matters not whether, whether we would be uh, women or, or men of ill repute or the, the, the pinnacle of society. We are born in sin, all of us. And in, in essence, we are sinners before God. And what God does, He looks at the heart to find faith. And if we exercise the ability to have faith that God has given every man, then God will find it and He will reward it. Let me stress that faith is not restricted to any uh, just specific group or a select group of people. Uh, you might find uh, that this is difficult to understand sometimes why people that may not be in the truth have miracles that take place. Why does God answer their prayer? What about a person that doesn't even really profess to believe in God and yet at some stage or another they might pray and somehow their prayer is answered. How do we explain that? Well, this is how we explain it. According to Scripture, God honors faith wherever He finds it. It doesn't mean, though, that we can stay there. We need to grow in that faith and that ability to be obedient so that we can grow in knowledge and understanding to God. But I want you to see that in spite of her condition, the fact that she was outside of the, of the commonwealth of Israel, outside of the people of God, 
in spite of the fact that she was obviously an idolatrous, she lived in a country and was raised amongst the, some of the most awful I idolatry that you could imagine in Canaan land, in spite of the fact that by occupation she obviously had a reputation as a woman of ill repute, God looked at her heart. Isn't that beautiful? Doesn't it tell you that if God can do this with Rahab, He can do it with any individual that you come across in your day-to-day -day, uh, life? And you can witness to them. God will reach out to them. In fact, we might say such uh, were some of us before Jesus found us. Amen. None of us cleanse, none of us clean, and certainly none of us righteous in ourselves. But what the difference was, <coughs> was that instead of using the human reasoning of her people, and I'll show you what their reasoning was, we are Jericho. Uh, just as an explanation, Jericho was a mighty fortress city. It was built up on a hill. There were such thick walls, in fact, several layers of walls that simply shouted power and strength and might, security. The human reasoning would say there is no way in the world the Israelites can break through our walls and, and, and get to us, regardless of their reputation, regardless of what we've heard. But faith in God said, God has given our city and our land into their hand. And so instead of adopting the thinking of the people of her, of her city, of her country, she adopted faith in God. And you know, there is power in faith when you believe in the Lord. <coughs> and so she took her stand. Now say a stand here. I want you to think of this because in your life, again and again and again, you will need to take a stand. You have to stand on one side or the other of the fence. You cannot ride the fence. You cannot be on the fence. You can't be for God and against God. This woman was born, grown in a situation that er, where all of her life, everything about her and her, her, her upbringing was against God. But when faith rose in her heart, when she heard of what was happening, and she must have somehow heard from God, faith arose in her heart, she took a stand. And she took a stand with the people of God. Against her own people. At her own risk, I might add. Because she was taking a huge personal risk. Understand this, that to hide enemies of the king was considered treason. So she did this at the cost or the risk of her own life. <clears throat> she could have easily have lost her own life in protecting the lives of the spies. And I uh, believe that... Uh, she understood this because she defied the king's command. We read it together this morning. The king sent word to her and said, bring out the people that have come to you. We know where they're from and we know what they're here for. Now, I'm sure that he didn't expect her physically to drag them out herself. But what, she was, what he was saying was, um, you support your king and, uh, and let us get them. And instead of doing that, she hid them. Now, <clears throat> there is arguments as to how she did it and so forth and we're not here to, to discuss that so much but I want you to notice that in our key verse that we read the Bible actually said that by faith she did not perish with those that believe not because she received say received received the spies in peace uh, the word of God doesn't praise her for the way she hid them and or more to the point for the lie that she said about hiding them but it does praise her for the heart of protecting the lives of the people she believed were going to conquer and therefore would in turn be able to protect her and her family. And so <coughs> this is the faith that she displayed. Uh, but can you see the personal risk? You know, I'm going to say to you sometimes you cannot live for God and you will not be able to take a stand for God without some risk. You may risk losing some friends. You may risk losing some popularity. Yes, you may risk losing some money or position or maybe some of the things that you prefer. And yes, you may not look so cool in the world, but I'm going to tell you something. The walls will come down and you will be safe. God will take care of you and you will be on the right side, meaning on the winning side, which is the only side to be in. Listen, get used to the idea. There is a battle afoot. It is God versus the power of evil. Amen. You understand that? And we need to stand on the right side. 
We need to make our choice to stand where God wants us. And yes, there is a personal risk, but we need to take it and uh, find ourselves worthy in God's eyes. Praise the Lord. Here it is. She displayed a faith that was worthy of God's honor, even if it was imperfect, even if at this time she hadn't learned all the principles of God. She hadn't been taught the scriptures. She hadn't been taught the, uh, the commandments of God. She hadn't been shown that to lie was incorrect or what have you. She did the best she could with what she had. But there was faith there. God saw it. God spotted faith and He rewarded it and He honored it. Can you see that? And at this point, what we find is that faith is what opens the door. In fact, this is the statement I want to make is that faith will open the door for all of us to enter into the kingdom of God. <clears throat> there is no other way for us to enter in. And there is no other way for us to continue our life in God, but to be people of faith. And if Rahab teaches us any lesson, if she is an example of anything, she is an example of faith and obedience. And so if you want to make it, if you want to enter in, if you have a desire to grow in God, then faith is necessary. Faith opens the door so that you can walk in and continue in your walk with God. On the other hand, of course, I want you to notice the opposite. Unbelief, on the other hand, is extremely costly. When we know God and we turn from God, or when we have heard of Jesus and we choose not to hear, imagine what would have happened if Rahab, like the rest of her countrymen, had heard of the reputation of the people of God coming. And instead of a heart rising in faith, she would have put it aside, just like the rest of the, what do you call them, Jer Jerichoans? <clears throat> I don't know what you call them, the inhabitants of Jericho in any case. If she, like them, had relied on the buttresses and the fortress that, that the city was, amazing thick walls. To this day, the excavation of these walls are a breathtaking sight. The foundations of it still stand, and they found Jericho, just for the record. The walls were massive, big, thick walls, and then inside that, yet another wall. And so, so uh, strong, and so uh, that she, Jericho was the greatest city in all of Canaan land. If she had reasoned the same way, along fleshly lines, instead of a spiritual mind or a spiritual faithful heart, then unbelief would have cost her dearly, as it did the rest of her countrymen. She would have lost her life and the lives of her family. So I want you to understand that faith is necessary. Say necessary here today. It's necessary. It's not an optional extra. Faith in God, and that is reflected in our love for Him, the way we serve Him, is a necessity in order for Him to reign. Unbelief, on the other hand, is extremely costly. And I want to put this question to you. Have you considered what unbelief has cost you? Have you considered what Stopping not believing in God, stopping short of believing what God has for you has cost you. I, I'm not talking just here on this earth alone. I'm not talking about what you lose here and now. What about what it could cost you eternally? If you're hearing the sound of my voice today, you still have a chance not to let unbelief take you out. How much does unbelief cost us? Think about it. It's unbelief that cost people in Jesus' day the miracles He could have performed. He could not do many mighty works there because of what? Their unbelief. Jesus wanted to, but He couldn't because of their unbelief. And I wonder sometimes how many times He wants to do a work in our lives. He wants to heal. He wants to supply. He wants to bring about a change. He wants to uh, just increase us. He wants to change us and strengthen us. But it doesn't happen because of our unbelief. I want you to think on that because that is literally the antithesis of what uh, Rahab was really all about. Rahab's faith. Let's continue on that thought for a little bit longer because you see what we find is that this woman testifies for God. You remember she hid the, uh, the, uh, the spies amongst the, uh, the flax and uh, once the guards had gone out of the city and had run out of the city looking for them, she goes to them and she begins to commune uh, with them or talk to them and, uh, and I find this quite amazing because her testimony uh, it is just really heartfelt and it's quite beautiful for someone who didn't know the Lord at all. And yet look at her words. Have a look. In fact, if you go back to Joshua chapter 2, read it with me. <coughs> I think it's in verse 8 to 11 that we're looking at. But specifically, uh, she's talking about how we heard what God has done. She believed 
the miracles that she had heard had happened in Egypt 40 years before and then all through the time. And Rahab testifies in verse 11. Have a look at this. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. And this is the testimony. For the Lord, notice, your God, He is God of heaven above and in earth beneath. He is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. This is a confession of her faith. It's a testimony of her faith. She is saying... I know that our city is full of deities and idols and, and false gods, but your God is God in heaven and is God on earth. Can you see the faith? And she testified it freely. She professed her faith. She didn't just say, oh yeah, I sort of believe God. She professed it openly. So much so that I believe she was an encouragement to these men uh, because they came as spies. They were literally... Uh, you know, on point of losing their lives. If she had turned them in any mo moment right now, uh, they could have lost their lives very easily. But here her testimony encourages them. And, sh and they can see this woman has been touched of God. What is that saying to the spies? God is on our side. God is, is, is going ahead of us. He's preparing these people. There is fear in their hearts. And this is one of the results. This woman is believing God. That's an encouragement, isn't it? You know, I believe God does that for you and I as we travel the road and stay faithful to Him, that God will send individuals to encourage us uh, with their testimonies. But what, what is amazing to me is that this is a testimony from a, a Gentile, a testimony of faith from someone who didn't belong to the, to the people of Israel. Uh, she had amazing faith to believe God in this manner. Don't forget she never went to the same uh, schooling that the Israelites did. Somehow, deep in her heart, she knew this God that could open the Red Sea is the God of heaven and the God of earth. He can do all things. And she was willing to believe this God. My question is, are you willing to believe this God? He is God Almighty. He can do all things if we believe Him and trust Him. And so, she put her faith in Him and it was the faith of a, of a testimony of faith from a Gentile woman, a woman who had not grown amongst the people. Do you know over the ministry of Jesus and of the apostles, various individuals who had not grown amongst the Jews per se, uh, demonstrated great faith. I'll go quickly through them, a couple of them. These were Gentiles, other Gentiles of great faith. The first one was a centurion uh, that came to Jesus because his servant was ill and he wanted Jesus to heal his servant. And, uh, and he actually followed his request with this other request, please, Lord, don't come to my house. I'm not worthy that you should come to my house. What a beautiful humility of heart. He said, but just speak the word. Because, see, I, I'm in charge of men. I know what it's like. If I say to, to one of my, uh, you know, the people I'm superior to, one of my soldiers, go and do something, he will go and do it. And he had such great faith in the power of Jesus that he knew that if Jesus would but speak the word, his servant would be healed. And that's exactly what happened. And Jesus commented what a great faith he had found in this man who was not even a Jew. He was not an Israelite. And so he spoke the words and on that very moment, at that very same time, his servant was healed. Great faith. Great faith believes God. Great faith trusts God where others are not willing to go that individual will go. Here's another example. A Syrophoenician woman, you might remember, her daughter was actually taken with the devil, the Bible says, and she could not uh, be delivered. And because she was not uh, of, the, of the Jewish faith, uh, at first, her request for healing or for deliverance for her woman, for her daughter, sorry, was actually turned away. In fact, if you remember, Jesus used words that might have been taken as offensive. He said something of this nature. He said, it's not, it's not appropriate for me to take the bread that belongs to the children and give it to dogs. You see, the Jews in those days saw any non-Jew or Gentile as a dog, as something, uh, well, I guess to be despaired at, to be avoided. Certainly not holy before God. And instead of being turned away and getting her back up and saying, right, why don't you call me a dog? I'll go somewhere else. Thank you very much. Not so. Humility of heart. Desire for God. What did she say? True, Lord. She admitted it. She said, yeah, true. But even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall 
from the master's table. Isn't it beautiful that such faith immediately found the right place in, in the Lord's heart? And straight away he turned and he said, Woman, I have not seen such great faith, not in Israel. In other words, with the people that should have known him, there was no such faith. Amongst his own people, he couldn't do great works because of their unbelief. But here was a woman who had not grown as an Israelitess, and yet she, in spite of being seen as perhaps lesser in that, in that situation, was willing to humble herself and in faith, great faith, trust God for healing. And that very day, uh, her family was healed. Another example we could give you very quickly is that of Cornelius. Of course, you remember he was uh, the leader of the Italian band. And uh, in that sense, he also was not a Jew, but a proselyte. <clears throat> but the Bible does say that his prayers that come before God as a memorial. And God was so pleased with him that he sent him message so that a, an apostle could come personally to preach the gospel to him and see him saved. I guess these are great examples of faith born not, if you please, in the church, not within the body of the, of the believers, but outside. Let me stress to you, the Bible says that God has given to every man, say every man, the measure of faith, not a measure, the measure, the ability to believe. And even though we live in a day and age where there is apostasy and incredible sin and amazing degradation in our society, I'm going to stress it for you this morning. There are still people who will believe God. Still individuals who can find faith and therefore develop that faith towards the Lord. It's still time to evangelize, to sow the seeds. There is a Rahab out there. And there is a Cornelius out there. And there's a Syrophoenician woman somewhere out there. There is, a, there is a centurion out there. Someone that may never have known about the things of God. But there is faith in their heart to believe. And if you will but reach them with the gospel, they will come to the Lord. Remember what we said earlier. God will honor faith wherever He finds it. Sometimes we allow the fact that uh, individuals live certain lifestyles or are looking a certain way, or do certain things, put us off from witnessing to them. Don't let that happen. What if that was your next Cornelius? What if that was the next Rahab? Remember, God will honor faith wherever He finds it. And I believe it is, it is necessary for us to have uh, this mind, not only that we are inspired by Rahab's faith to be faithful, but in turn that we recognize that there are individuals out there who may yet believe in spite of the conditions we live in. And what was beautiful about her is that she didn't, just did, didn't believe just for herself. She believed for her father, her mother, her brothers and her sisters, the entire family. She didn't want just to be saved alone. She wanted the entire household to be saved. And she was willing to be obedient for that to happen. Now, of course, we understand from the... Uh, the story we've read, the scriptures we read, that this was a matter of life and death for Rahab, for her family, and of course for the spies. They were dependent on her not speaking uh, against them and not turning them in. And conversely, she was dependent on them to honor their word and protect her on the day that they would come to destroy the city. Now, I can assure you at this point, these spies had no idea how God was going to deliver the city, but they believed that God was going to. So God had a plan, you see. And sometimes this is how you've got to see it. God has a plan. We don't know exactly how we fit into that plan, but we must by faith trust Him that He knows what He's doing. Amen? And if you will believe Him that way, then God will use you very, very much so and mightily. And so, of course, the response from uh, the spies was, Our life for yours. Our lives for yours. If you protect us right now and provided you don't say anything about our business here and, and you know, basically they were asking her to be faithful, then we will carry out the promise that we have uh, made to you. And so we see that the faith of Rahab is certainly something to be noticed, isn't it? And I pray that we can develop faith of this nature that can believe not because of all the evidences, not because of all the experiences, but simply because you believe in God. I think one of the problems that we have today is that believe, we, we tend to believe in what God can do, but we don't believe in God Himself. That's right. We love what God can do, but we don't love Him personally. 
And I think sometimes there is a love for Christianity, but not a love for Christ. And there is even a faith in Christianity as a religion, but not a faith in Christ. And that's a sad, sad loss. We need to return to the kind of personal relationship that puts us in the, in the, in the right tune, in sync with God. This woman was in sync with God. She didn't have the religion of the Jews. She didn't know anything about them, but she somehow had faith in God. All right, praise the Lord. Let me uh, point to you, however, another aspect of this uh, woman's um, life that speaks to us, and that's her obedience. We have made a point of saying uh, that, you see, faith is necessary, but faith without works, James said, is, is quite dead. And the way that we demonstrate our faith, the way that we demonstrate our love to God is by being obedient, by doing what He says. We can only fool ourselves and try to fool others if we think that we can say we love God and that we are being uh, faithful to God when we are disobedient to His Word. That cannot happen. The two things are opposites. But let me make this statement up front. It says God promises us many things, including eternal life, if we will but and just trust or believe and obey His Word. Say obey this morning. Trust and obey, for there is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Faith and obedience go hand in hand in the Bible, saints. You cannot separate them. People that say, oh yes, I believe God, but then go off and do all the acts of disobedience against God cannot possibly believe God. If they did, they would believe what He says about those acts of disobedience. Is that fair enough? We can't have have it both ways. We cannot be in one camp and the other. Notice Rahab had to take a stand. She had to take her place with God's people. And you can only do one or the other. Sooner or later, the walls will fall down. Okay then, well, when do we obey? Tomorrow? Next week? Obey while you can. Because you don't know if you've got tomorrow. We don't know if we've got the next moment, actually. And so we need to obey God while we can, and that means putting into practice the Word of God. Now, in Matthew 10, 42, Jesus said these words, And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only, in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. You see, that scripture reflects the action that's found behind the faith. It's an action of obedience. When we, as a disciple, obey God and we supply, follow up on the faith, we give, in, as, as the scripture describes, in this sense, we are actually obeying God. Now, you can believe uh, that it is appropriate to do good works or to do something good and never do them. But it is the moment that we actually perform the action in faith that follows faith, that's obedience, right, that we have what? A reward. And if we do it, we will not lose our reward according to Scripture. I guess that what we are wanting to say is that there are opportunities right now that surround you. And the opportunity to help a needy person, the opportunity to reach out to someone, the opportunity to love them in Jesus, to see them come to salvation, to see them come to repentance, may not knock again. What if you don't do it today and they're dead tomorrow? Uh, what if you're dead tomorrow? Uh, what if, what if, if, if there's simply not another, you never see them again? Have you had those, uh, those, those experiences where you knew you should have acted, but you didn't? And you'd live to regret it and to repent before God for disobedience, right? And so it's important that we are obedient, that we are obedient quickly, that we don't wait on that obedience just like she didn't. You know, straight away, she saw the opportunity to not only do good, but in turn to, to obey God. And she took it. And I think that that's a beautiful example of faith and obedience. Let me move on because I don't want to run out of time. There is a scarlet cord that is mentioned in this, in this passage of Scripture. And I, I love it because it has beautiful spiritual meaning and application. And I'm going to try not to get lost in all of that today. But there is so much that could be said about this one aspect of this story alone, this scarlet cord. You remember that at some stage she let them out of the window and they climbed down. And they said to her, now if you want to be saved, this is what you're going to have to be do doing. You make sure that this scarlet cord, this, this, this thread is hanging out your window so we can see it. 
it was an act of obedience. And there were several other things that she had to do. And you'll see in a moment, we'll cover those. But I want to say that her salvation was conditional. Say conditional. Some people believe that you just believe God and that's it. It's all done. Not so in the Bible. Again and again, we have evidences in the scripture that salvation is conditional on faith and on obedience. We can stay saved or we can lose our salvation. You can't be saved once and be saved forever. You've got to stay saved throughout life. That's what the Bible teaches. Her salvation was conditional. Remember, she had faith to believe. But what if she hadn't obeyed? What if she hadn't put the scarlet thread out? What if she hadn't gathered her family into her household? Would she have been saved? In fact, the spies were so strong on this point that they said, if you don't do the things we tell you, our oath that we've made to you, we are free of it. Don't even consider it because we, we can't help you. Can you see faith and obedience go hand in hand? Very, very important. Okay, in the Bible, as I said, faith and obedience are inseparable. You cannot have one without the other. And so it's important uh, that we do what is necessary. What she did, she immediately tied the scarlet cord to the window in full view. Now, I wonder what her country men or city people thought. Why is she doing that? Maybe they asked, maybe they didn't. I'm not sure. The Bible doesn't say, but it was in full view. And I think it's important because not only was that outside the window, her family was to be kept inside her house in order to be saved. Specific steps of obedience had to be carried out for her to be saved. Does that ring a bell with you? You see, salvation isn't just some sort of flimsical, general, whatever you believe is okay. No, no, no. The Bible speaks very clearly of steps of salvation, of obedience that we must do. First of all, we must believe Jesus. Of course, it's faith. But then it says we must repent of our sins. Say repent this morning. And then it says we must be buried in Jesus' name by baptism for the remission, the washing away of our sins. It then speaks about being raised again with Christ to walk in newness of life. This is being filled with the Spirit of God. Specific steps of obedience. It doesn't stop there. It says then you need to walk what? In righteousness, day after day, obeying God's Word. And in holiness before God, without which no man will see the Lord. We kid ourselves if we think we can make it to heaven without remaining holy in the sight of God, saints. You won't make it. The scripture is clear on it. It's a necessary step of obedience. And so we continue. And then we do this when? All the way through until the end. Faithfulness until the end. So she was to follow specific steps to be saved. Her family was to be inside and she was to remain faithful and maintain their trust. Remember twice they said to her, but you cannot say this to anybody. You have to keep it to yourself. You, you cannot give us away. She had to keep the trust. Can you see the faithfulness implied there? We have to be on the Lord's side and, uh, and what? Remain there. We can't keep swapping, changing. And what's the old story? Uh, put your right foot in and then you put your right foot out. You can't play the hokey pokey with God. You take your stand and you stay stood in God. That's faithfulness. The minute we start going in and out of God, we're losing out our relationship with Him. No hokey pokey. All right, so destruction was going to come. It was going to be very soon for Jericho, but for Rahab and her household, there was going to be salvation. The scarlet thread typifies the blood of Jesus. It was hanging out of her window. It was in full view. And when you have the blood of Jesus, apply it to your life. The blood of Jesus will cleanse you from all sins. It will protect your soul. The blood of Jesus is what cleanses us and keeps us strong and powerful. There is power in the blood. Amen? And that's really what that scarlet thread is representing. And it runs right through. You'll find that it is the very, very thread that speaks of the blood that was shed at Calvary. Interestingly, you will discover that this woman became a, one of the forefathers or, uh, from which eventually Jesus descended. I want to finish with a couple of slides quickly to show you this, that for, for Israel coming into Canaan land, Jericho was the first test and it was a pretty tough one. You see, Jericho for us represents the world system, all that is estranged and distance from God. Can you see that's what we're living in today? A world that's estranged from God. Largely, people don't want to know about the true God. And as a result, they destined themselves for judgment. Well, Rahab, conversely, represents those who through faith 
obey the word of God and become saved. And, and I think that this is really what Israel was facing. It was, it was a physical battle. But for us, Jericho is very much a very same spiritual battle. Every day we are faced with a Jericho. Every day we are faced with these walls that are in front of us. And in faith, we need to stand for God. Israel experienced, had experienced God's power and miracles in the past. They were behind them. And I, I suppose that I want to say this is a good thing because that reputation preceded them. If you remember, the testimony of Rahab was that the witness that uh, of what had happened in their lives had preceded them. And it was so powerful that the hearts of the people were melting inside of them. What's going to happen when these people arrive here? They have a powerful God. Can, we stand, can our walls stand up to them? Well, as a, as a result, we find out no, they can't. You see, God is too powerful for any war, okay? But the fact is that witness had preceded them. But I want you to notice they couldn't live in the past. And here, let me say it to you, saints. None of us can live in the glory of the past. Has God blessed you in the past? Yes. That was great then, but that doesn't last today. Today, God wants to bless you all over again. Has God healed you in the past? Have you had a miracle in the past? Or has, has He been a God of provision and blessing in the past? Yes, yes, and yes, and yes. We can answer yes many times. But God doesn't judge our lives today by that which happened in the past. It is our present faithfulness, our present love for God, our present relationship with God that has all to do with where we stand in the Lord. And that is why we cannot live in the glory of the past. We must make certain that we renew our relationship with God every single day. God wants to perform more miracles. Yes, He opened the Red Sea, but now He was going to throw down some pretty thick walls. Amen. And has He thrown down any walls in your life re recently? Because if He hasn't, He wants to, if you will just let Him. Saints, we can only win against our Jerichos if we lean on God and we allow Him to give us the plan of attack. The strategies that God will give you are quite unique. Now, I, I have to cover this quickly, but you do know the story very well, uh, just to highlight the fact that God's ways uh, are not our ways. I mean, really, when you think about it, from a military standpoint, what God asked Joshua and the Israelites to do was a nightmare, was an absolute you know, joke in a military sense. From a man's standpoint, I mean, who goes against a city with mighty big thick walls, buttressed and so forth, with not a single weapon in hand, but rather quietly marching around it with just the horns of the priests following the, the ark once a day for six days? Who does that? Who goes to battle in that manner against a city? I think if we were to plan the attack and the strategy, we would consider some pretty big guns or something. But God's ways are not our ways. And I think what we need to learn from the story is that God has ways of doing things that will be very effective if we'll just lean on Him. And we will win against Jericho because of it. On the seventh day, as you know, uh, well, they had to shout with all their might and they, the, uh, the trumpet sounded and all that quietness of the previous six days was broken in this amazing sound. And the sound wasn't what brought the, the walls down. Some people have postulated that it was that sound that sort of rattled the walls. Uh, I don't think so. Check out the walls. Go on, a, on, a, on your websites. Have a look at the thickness of those things. Shout all you want. They came down because of sound. They came down because of the power of God. That sound was the sound of worship to God. The response from God is an amazing blessing. Worship to God brings blessing from God. Faith to God brings blessing from God. And so we need to remember Israel's test was a pretty big one. And, uh, but they had to be explicit in their obedience in order to bring about a victory. And not only that, they had to move in complete harmony and trust, first of all, in God and with their leaders. Imagine if some of them had said, I don't want to do this. This is silly. I feel silly walking around the city. I'm a, I'm a soldier. I fight. I don't just walk around quiet. If they hadn't all stayed in their place and performed their duty selflessly, doing what God had shown them to do, in obedience to God, Jericho would still be standing today more than likely. Here, let me put it at your doorstep. You have a duty to perform. 
And you can whinge and complain and ramble and, and grouch and carry on all you want, but until you do your part, God cannot bless. Is that clear enough? Sometimes we don't win battles and we can't see souls saved because somebody is too busy grumping and grouching and complaining and whinging about what God has said to do. But if we did it God's way, we would simply allow that God has His ways that may not be our ways. And we may not always understand what God has, God has in mind, but we would obey and be explicit in our obedience that we may see the victory that God intends to give us. Well, we don't always win the victories against our Jerichos, but Israel did. And uh, they, uh, that was the first test, and by the grace of God, they passed. Praise the Lord. Amen. And I would like to think that you and I can have a stamp like that. Pass this test. Amen. Another Jericho. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Another battle. Another wall. Passed. In Jesus' name. Because we trusted Him. Because we looked to Him. And that's the kind of response that we really want. All right. Let me conclude with this then. Jericho fell. It fell. Didn't matter how thick the walls were, saints of God. It fell. And it fell hard. It fell quickly. And it fell so amazingly that the Jerokians, whatever you might call them themselves, didn't know what to do with themselves. So much so the Bible says that all of the people of Israel, the army that had been marching around the citadel, incredibly fortress city, were able to go up, every man in front of himself. So once the walls fell down, they were able to literally walk into the city and destroy the city. I want you to notice, and that's a pretty good representation, Rahab's place, the Bible tells us, was right on the wall, remember? And now she, nor she, all the spies knew how God was going to deliver the city, but God had a plan. And there it was. All of the wolves fell down except the place where she lived, where she and her family were safely kept. And notice the thread. The red thread was at the window. She kept her promise. She kept and obeyed the directives of God. You know, we shouldn't be surprised when we are obedient to God that we see amazing results. But we should be surprised, uh, you know, that unfortunately we're not obedient more often because we've seen the hand of God so frequently and God wants us to have victories. And so the walls fell down, saints, and they will fall down. If you have a Jericho in your life, it looks pretty tough. You don't think you can push it down. Chances are you can't, but God can. And it may be, may be that you have to trust God for a plan of attack, a strategy by which this thing is going to come down. But one thing is for certain, if you will obey God. Joshua spent a time in prayer before the battle, and he saw a man dressed in, in battle array. And he said, are, are you for us? And of course, once this angel of the Lord declared that he was the, uh, of the army of God, and he was in, employed by the Lord, uh, Joshua knew this was it. This was the answer from God. God was sending the mighty angels from heaven to bring these walls down. <laughs> Praise God. And God gave him specific instructions which he and the people followed. And the walls came tumbling down. As we remember from our Sunday school songs, they came tumbling down. Rahab was saved whilst, in fact, all of Jericho was destroyed. How can God do that? How can he bring down the entire wall and safeguard just a little portion of it where his people are? Is anything too hard for our God? Remember when we studied in 2 Peter that God is going to bring judgment, but yet, yet He's going to protect His people? Look at this. Right in the middle of the most amazing judgment, Rahab and her family were saved. And so I believe with all my heart that God is able to keep His people and that He will protect them. Okay, right on. There was a great victory then, and that's what we see at Jericho. An amazing victory. But most of all, and most importantly, Rahab found a place in history. To this day, we speak of Rahab the harlot, but that's what she was. What she became was the, the, the wife of a prince in Israel. His name was Salmon. Yeah, just like the fish, actually. And he was the father of Boaz, who married Ruth, from whom eventually, through that line, came the Lord Jesus Christ. What an amazing story. What an incredible act of faith. And I want you to remember in closing then two things. That she is an example of faith and obedience to us. But these are two things to remember. Firstly, that one single act of faith can have amazingly far-reaching repercussions or effects. Please, 
please trust God in faith. Don't get tired to stand in faith because one act of faith can do amazing things and can have amazing effects in your life and in the life of those that are close to you. I mean, who would ever have imagined that in the genealogy of Jesus you would find a harlot and then someone that wasn't even part of the commonwealth of Israel. And yet there it is. God is no respecter of person. He looks at faith and rewards it where it is. Remember, your act of faith could have amazingly and far-reaching uh, repercussions and effects. And the second thing that I want to mention in closing is that it doesn't matter where we begin in our walk with God. We all begin, unfortunately, in a place of sin and degradation, right? It doesn't matter where we begin. What does matter is how we develop and how we stay faithful to God. Praise the Lord. Will you stand with me here today? Thank you for your attention. We appreciate your love for the Word of God. And I pray that you have less learned a lesson or that you can take something home to your heart from the life of Rahab, what the Bible calls Rahab the harlot, a woman who had faith in God and was willing to be obedient. Nothing is too difficult for God, saints. And your act of faith could mean the salvation of individuals long after you're gone. So stay faithful to God. Stay true to the Lord. And remember, it depends not where we start, but where we end. That's what matters. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Brother Bill, could I ask you to close the meeting in prayer, please, my brother? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord.